Although most ships are hard to tell apart, when you spot one with a couple of humps, it's immediately obvious that it's some sort of gas carrier. Possibly not methane, but it could be carrying any one of a number of liquefied petroleum gases or chemicals that are routinely carried by sea. The distinctive humps are actually just a protrusion of the cargo tanks, sticking up above the visible deck line in order to fit as much cargo as possible into a given hull size. You see, the problem with ships is that they're very efficient when it comes to transporting dense cargoes, but when the cargo is a gas, it's just not economical unless you can squeeze a lot of it on board. When we say gases, the main ones we're talking about are LNG and LPGs, so essentially hydrocarbon chains that are a product of the oil industry. The lightest is methane, or liquefied natural gas, which is a single carbon atom surrounded by four hydrogen atoms. To make the liquefied petroleum gases, you simply add in additional carbon atoms with pairs of hydrogen atoms to get ethane, propane, butane and pentane. As you can see, the chemical composition of each is different, but they do all share similar characteristics in that they all exist in gaseous form in normal atmospheric conditions, meaning they take up too much space to be economical to transport by sea. Fortunately though, there are some very simple laws of physics that we can use to reduce the volume of a gas. You can either reduce its temperature or increase its pressure. That's basic high school level stuff and will get you a reasonable solution, but the real magic starts to happen if we push it to its extremes and get to a phase transition. In other words, get to the point where the gas turns into a liquid. The easiest way to think of it is to consider it in reverse. Boil a pan of water and it will absorb energy right up until it reaches its boiling point. Once there, it will essentially stay at the same temperature while all the additional energy goes into the phase transition, turning the water into a gas, massively increasing its volume. Once it's all transformed into a gas, you can continue to increase the energy or temperature and the volume will continue to increase. During that phase transition, you essentially have a stable temperature area where the volume is massively increasing before the gas then follows the ideal gas relationship we were taught about in school. Coming back to our gaseous hydrocarbons, that same knowledge tells us that in gaseous form, we could reduce the volume quite a bit, but if we can reach a phase transition, suddenly we can get a massive volume reduction. We're actually talking four to 600 times smaller for typical gas cargoes that are carried on ships in liquid form. That's all great of course, but how do we actually get there? Well, let's take a cup full of example ane and think it through. Obviously, if it's a liquid at some temperature and pressure, the molecules might gradually evaporate from the surface until it has all turned into a gas, but if we place a lid on top so that it can't get away, then the vapours will instead become trapped. As evaporation happens, the space above the liquid will gradually become saturated with example ane vapours and the pressure within the system will increase as more of the liquid becomes a gas and takes up more space. Naturally, the increasing saturation will mean that some of the molecules in the vapour will start to recondense on the surface of the liquid until eventually you'll reach a point where the rate of evaporation or escaping molecules will match the rate of condensation. The pressure that this occurs at is known as the saturated vapour pressure and it will vary for each gas depending on the temperature. At higher temperatures, the molecules will all have more energy so the saturated vapour pressure will be higher. Likewise, at lower temperatures, the molecules will all have less energy so the saturated vapour pressure will be lower. In fact, if you lower the temperature enough, you can bring the saturated vapour pressure all the way down to one bar or atmospheric pressure. In other words, at this temperature, example ane could remain contained as a liquid at atmospheric pressure by simply placing a lid on top. With water, this happens at 100 degrees C and is otherwise known as the atmospheric boiling point. If you keep it at 100 degrees, a closed system will remain with hot liquid water and steam above that's condensing at the same rate that it's evaporating. For LNG or LPGs, this happens at different temperatures for each product. Methane at minus 161.5 degrees, right the way through to butane at a practically tropical minus half a degree. If you keep the product below its atmospheric boiling point, you can simply transport it in a sealed container so that the vapours don't escape and it will remain at atmospheric pressure, meaning you don't need anything strong to hold it in. But that's easier said than done. Sure, it's possible to transport gases by refrigeration alone, but it's expensive and if your refrigeration system fails, then your entire cargo will quickly evaporate. So instead, we can start to think about pressurisation. The thing is, pressurisation sort of ignores the inherent energy contained within the movement of the molecules themselves, meaning that there's a hard limit where you will no longer be able to liquefy a gas by pressurisation alone. 
This is known as the critical temperature and it varies by product from minus 82 and a half degrees for methane right the way through to 153 degrees for butane. In other words, we can say that as long as your methane is at a temperature of less than minus 82 and a half degrees, then it's possible to contain in liquid form using pressure alone. Incidentally, the pressure needed to contain each gas at its critical temperature is known as the critical pressure. For methane, this is 44.7 bar and the rest we can note down similarly. Remember when I said at the beginning that a ship with humps may not be carrying methane? Well, hopefully you can now see why. You could carry methane in liquid form using pressure alone, but you would need it to withstand at least 44.7 bar of pressure and it would need to be cooled to minus 82 and a half degrees anyway. In reality, once you have refrigeration and insulation so sophisticated that it can keep the cargo down at minus 82 and a half degrees, you might as well just keep going and get it down to its atmospheric boiling point and then you can have a much less substantial containment system. Methane ships generally only use temperature for containment, so they're designed as more of a giant insulated flask rather than as a pressurized vessel. When I mentioned that they may not have humps, well, sometimes they do, but it's for insulation purposes rather than for pressurization. Of course, for all other gases, there will be some sort of sweet spot that you can find with a temperature between its atmospheric boiling point and its critical temperature and a pressure somewhere between atmospheric pressure and critical pressure. For example, notice how butane and propane have critical temperatures much higher than normal air temperatures. This means that they can be transported using pressurization alone, which is why you can buy them in gas canisters from normal shops. I mean, with butane, you barely need any containment at all because at normal temperatures, its vapor pressure is only around two bar, so you can even contain it within a plastic lighter case. Who'd have thought that the humble cigarette lighter would use the same physics as billion dollar gas carriers? Anyway, with each of the gases that we've talked about, all you need to do is find some combination of temperature and pressure, which will allow the gas to undertake a phase transition from gas to liquid, massively reducing its volume to make it economical to carry. For most cargoes, that will involve an increase in pressure, which will mean special cargo tanks designed specifically to cope with the extreme pressures. Cylinders do work and are the more efficient shape to fit into a ship's design, but if you want really high pressures, then you can't beat a sphere. The thing is, to fit a sphere into a ship, you will end up with a great big hump above deck level with multiple humps along the length depending on the size of the ship. It makes it really easy for me to spot these sort of ships and now that you've seen this video, hopefully really easy for you to spot them too. Finally, I would just like to extend a massive thanks to our Plus supporters on Patreon. Your continued support helps to keep these videos free to view across social media, so on behalf of everyone watching, thank you all so much.